Good afternoon, and welcome to the fifth week of the American Presidency, our series of conversations with noted historians, scholars, and journalists about the people and events that have defined the most important elected office in the world. Our program is brought to you by the Lyndon B. Johnson Presidential Library, the University of Texas Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and Humanities Texas. I'm Phil Barnes, and it is my privilege to chair the UT Ali Sage Enrichment Committee. Mark Lawrence, the director of the Presidential Library, my good friend, and himself a widely respected and published historian, is the host of our conversations. As a member of the audience, you may participate in the Q&A segment of our program by using the chat function to write and submit questions. Our Q&A host today is my UT Ali colleague and our friend, Sandy Crest. Our theme for this year's series has been the American presidency, pivotal elections, I look back at six of our 59 presidential campaigns and elections, deemed by many to be among the most consequential in American history. And this itself is a reminder that the election of 2024, coming up this year, will not be the only consequential and pivotal election that our nation has experienced. Our special guest today is Carl Rowe, one of the nation's premier political consultants and advisors, perhaps best known as the architect of the 2000 and 2004 presidential campaigns of George W. Bush. He is also an astute observer of American politics and public policy, which is reflected in his weekly op-ed column in the Wall Street Journal. His column appears each Thursday, and it is well worth reading. I commend it to you. And Carl is the author of two books, including the critically acclaimed The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. Our political environment today is in many ways an echo of that of 1896. A nation changing by a growing immigrant population, an uncertain economy, disrupted in part by new and emerging technologies, a growing income inequality, and the seeming inability of a divided country to meet these challenges. And his campaign against the charismatic William Jennings Bryan, William McKinley addressed these issues, as Carl says, as a matter of principle, framing his support for tariffs and the gold standard as a means of lifting up the economic well being of all Americans, while always treating his opponents with respect. And that way, he won the admiration of both his friends and his opponents. And he won the race by running the first modern presidential campaign in American history. And Carl Rowe, who knows something about successful campaigns, tells the story of the election with notable admiration for McKinley, the man, the candidate, and the president. In his words, William McKinley aimed to unite a divided country, reignite the economy, and reinvigorate his party. And that he did. So we welcome for today's interview, Carl Rowe, the author of The Triumph of William McKinley, Why the Election of 1896 Still Matters. And now to Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you, Phil, and good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to 
this afternoon's program about the election of 1896. And it's great to have you all. And it's particularly great to have our special guest, none other than Carl Rove. Carl, you are known for many things. And one of them that I would say really belongs close to the top of that list is this uh, really fascinating book about what you've convinced me is, in fact, one of the pivotal elections of, of American history. Welcome. It's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark. Carl, you are, you are obviously a, a very busy man with lots to keep you busy in connection with politics in the present moment. What drew you to the election of 1896? Why write this book? Well, I wanted to write the book because I wanted to get my BA from the University of Texas. <laughs> I was teaching a, a class, I'd taught a class in, the, uh, in an undergraduate appointment between the government department and the journalism department for five or six years. And I was teaching a class at the LBJ school and uh, courtesy of temporary Dean Max Sherman and the chairman of the government department, uh, Jim Fishkin said, we'll, we'll fast track you for a PhD, but uh, you're 44 and you got to get your BA before we can enter you in the <laughs> PhD program. And so I had to fulfill the upper division writing requirement. There was absolutely no evidence I could string two sentences together after running a public affairs firm for 18 years. So I, I signed up for, uh, I think it was history 351, uh, which uh, all you had to do was uh, do a paper in the original source documents, uh, write a paper, and you could get three hours and fulfill the upper division writing requirement. I had no idea that while it was in the catalog, nobody ever did it. And uh, somehow or another, through serendipity, I walked into the history department, was told nobody ever did it, thought I might try my hand anyway, ask if there was a professor around. There was one in the office that day, that summer, and it was Lewis Gould, who was unknown to me, but he sort of vaguely knew who I was. And he said, what do you want to write about? And I said, I want to write about Theodore Roosevelt in the 1896 election. How did he rescue his career? And Gould said, I've never done this, but I'll take you on. Uh, but you've got to read the McKinley papers because history gets McKinley wrong. And the more I delved into the disorganized, uh, voluminous uh, McKinley papers, the more I became convinced he was absolutely right. Only every undergraduate paper turned into such a, a, right. a, a monumental accomplishment. Um, obviously, I want to get into a lot of the details of the 1896 race that you bring to life in such interesting ways. But let, let me ask you, first of all, about a really strong assertion you make um, at the very end of the book. You say McKinley's victory in 1896 created a new political system in the United States. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm, I'm not the first to say that. Uh, in 1955, V.O. Key wrote a prominent political scientist, wrote a, th a paper about it, uh, uh, the theory of critical elections. And it was then echoed in a book. I, I have my copy of it. It cost me $1.75 when I was an undergraduate. Critical Elections and the Mainsprings of American Politics by Walter Dean Burnham, who at that point was at MIT, but came to speak, uh, came to teach at UT. And political scientists have said that there are um, elections in which the political system in America is one way beforehand and then is a different way afterwards and has some continuity. Uh, the election of 1800, the end of the Federalist uh, Party, uh, dominance of American politics, the growth of Jeffersonian Republicans, uh, that lasts until 1828. Then we have another critical election with Andrew Jackson and the creation of the Democratic Party in 1860. Uh, the election of Abraham Lincoln and the Republican Party, 1896, which breaks the deadlock of the Gilded Age, 1932, and some suggest 1980 is another realigning election. But think about the Gilded Age. We have five presidential elections in a row leading up to 1896 in which nobody gets 50% of the vote. Oh. In, in two of those elections, the winner of the Electoral College has lost the popular vote. And in three of those elections, the, the race is settled by less than a percent between the uh, between the two candidates. We have four years with Republican president, House and Senate, two years with the Democratic president, House and Senate. And the rest of that quarter century is divided government in which virtually nothing gets done because these men hate each other's guts. They're still fighting the Civil War only on the floor of the House and Senate. Oh. And, and let's face it, the, many of the pre, most of the presidents of that Gilded Age era, the Garfields, the Arthurs, et cetera, are not all that well known. They're, they're pretty obscure when it comes to American presidential history. You do a lot to bring William McKinley to life, and you, you obviously really like him. You, you write about McKinley 
in in glowing terms. Uh, before we get into where he stood on the policy issues, just talk a little bit about your 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 thoughts about his character, who he was, and and, and if I'm right about this, why you like him so much. Well, uh, I do like him. Uh, he's an admirable person. That's the starting point. He's brought up in a a modest house and a modest home in northwest, uh, excuse me, northeast Ohio. Uh, son of abolitionist parents, um, uh, enlists in the in the uh, U.S. Army at the age of eighteen at the beginning of the Civil War. Fights through the entire Civil War and ends the war as a as a major, and um, has three battlefield promotions for unbelievable valor. Uh, is uh, takes himself on two suicide missions. He's ordered on one. He devises another suicide mission for himself and somehow survives. He's recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, but refuses to have his application pushed, saying, "I was only doing my duty." Uh, he then enters politics. In 1890, uh, in, in, in 1865 and 66, uh, he campaigns for his commander, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, who was the man who sent him on a suicide mission at the Battle of Kernstown. And when he enters politics, he, he turns out to be a remarkable legislator and a wonderful personality. Even his uh, political opponents, Democrats, um, find him to be an admirable person. And in fact, this was routine during the Gilded Age that if you were a member of the minority who had won re-election by a narrow margin, you were uh, the majority party phonied up an election challenge and kicked you out of the House. This happened 64 times between 1874 and 1904. And in 1884, he is kicked out of the House. And the only, I mean, he'd won re-election by seven votes uh, in a swing district. There was no evidence whatsoever of fraud, but it was just, it was close enough and the Democrats could do it. So they did it. And the only unusual thing about it was that a large number of senior Democrats voted to retain him in the House as a mark of respect. And and he was a, he just, he took on great causes and, uh, and he fought for the right things. He was a staunch advocate for black voting rights. In fact, when, when Hayes gets elected governor, uh, McKinley is almost morose because a constitutional amendment guaranteeing black voting rights goes down. Oh. And, uh, he's the first candidate, Republican or Democrat, to openly meet with black voters, which he does in 1895, and ask for their support. It, it feels like that, you know, that maybe many eras of American history, but certainly the, the Gilded Age is one of those moments where, you know, you sort of think of the, the smoke-filled rooms and the kind of, you know, machinations of, cynical machinations of American politics. And here's this guy that you describe as kind of an upstanding moral, you know, uh, figure. What made him effective as a politician in an era that might have, you know, privileged people who had a different set of skills? Well, he was very smart and he understood how uh, how to, to to deal with people and, 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 and how important it was not to take this personally. One of his great uh, relationships is with uh, Joe Foraker, who became governor of of, uh, of Ohio, viewed himself as a presidential candidate, one of the most egotistical people I've ever stumbled across right. in politics, and, and, and brittle, and, and, and quick to take, take uh, uh, you know, to get mad about things. And McKinley adroitly keeps him close mm. and deals with him in such a way that when he, McKinley, decides to run for president, uh, Four Acre is, you know, it's impossible for Four Acre to do anything other than support him begrudgingly mm and uh, to help him carry a united Ohio into the national uh, into the national convention. But, you know, to me, one of the measures of a political leader is when they do the tough thing for the right reasons, no matter what the consequences are. The most powerful political group during this age on the Republican side is the American Protective Association, which is not a pro-tariff group. It is an anti-immigrant group, which at one point claimed to have a membership of 13 million people. And, it, and in 1895 and 1896, they oppose him and they oppose him for president. He's the only Republican candidate they say is unacceptable. And it's because when he ran for governor and was elected governor, uh, they approached him and said there are Catholic, uh, you know, prison guards and you need to fire them. And he refused to do so. Oh. And uh, they couldn't believe it. And they, they, they opposed his reelection. He won by a bigger margin. So then when he ran for president, they said, completely unacceptable. And they were a huge power. And he took them on. They went after him. And he responded with good humor. He had his campaign put out a press statement. 
listing all of the secret organizations that he was a member of, the college fraternity that he was a member of, the Grand Army of the Republic, the Union Veterans, uh, Loyal Veterans League, you know, and so forth, you know, member of a Methodist church. I mean, these were all the secret societies that he had, was admitting to, which is a way of mocking his political opponent. And he stood up to him and beat him. Uh, and at the convention, uh, has a rabbi give the benediction at one and a black preacher uh, give the uh, the invocation at another session. And it was his way of basically saying, uh, you know what, I'm, I, I won. And uh, I'm going to continue to uh, to advocate an open uh, a party that's uh, available to all and Carl, he he had to deal as well with the so-called combine, right? This, right. The, the these sort of machine politicians focused on New York and Pennsylvania. You have a lot to say about these quintessentially, I think, late nineteenth century uh, politicians who are mostly concerned about patronage. Um, how, go a little further with uh, sort so, of how he maneuvered in this world. How did he deal it, with them? Yeah, well, look, in the Gilded Age, it, it was normal for the Republicans to gather at convention. And then th there would be powerful um, uh, leaders in the party, generally in states with patronage. You know, uh, Thomas Collier Platt, the easy boss, former senator from New York who controls the New York Republican Party. He has, you know, when the Republicans can control the governorship, thousands of jobs in the state government. And then he also has the very powerful position when the Republicans hold the White House, as they do for all but eight years during this period of the Gilded Age. He has the New York Customs Office, where the, the head of the Customs Office gets paid a percentage of the customs he collects. So largest port in America, very wealthy position. And so these men were practical politicians. They wanted to win which was the one saving grace they had, but they wanted they wanted to be in charge. They wanted to make the decisions, and they generally showed up at the convention uh, with uh, control over their delegates and, and nearby delegations. New York, for example, dominated Connecticut and New Jersey as well. And in 1895 and 1896, they're not for McKinley because he's, he, he literally is saying, I'm taking on the bosses. They were for Thomas Brackett Reed, the Speaker of the House from Maine. And one of the most interesting characters is the blonde boss, William G. Larimer, the, the Chicago uh, congressman who started out as a uh, as a as a driver of of, of uh, you know public transportation, and by the time he's in his 30s, he's elected to Congress and controls 20,000 patronage jobs in Cook County, Chicago. You may think of Chicago as being a Democratic machine, but in the 1890s, it's a Republican machine, and he's in charge of it. And McKinley takes the bosses on, and he does so by both attacking them for being bosses and saying that he represents the people, but also smartly not waiting for them to make the decisions. And one of the keys to the convention of the Republican convention is the South. The Republicans don't get electoral votes there, but they get delegates from there, most many of them black. And what happens is they show up at the convention and the bosses then, you know, promise them jobs and provide them money at the convention. And um, and what happens is McKinley, the year before the convention, goes to the South. Uh, his campaign, his close friend and campaign chairman, Mark Hanna, has a home in what is then the Palm Beach of the South, uh, uh, Thomasville, Georgia. And uh, it just happens to be at the junction of three railroads. And McKinley invites the Southern Republican leaders to come and meet him. And by accident, I found out who they were. We Historians have always wondered who came. And I found out a number of them that came by checking the registers of the local hotels, uh, which were published in the little newspaper, which is now online. And Black Republican leaders are being invited by the former chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, the governor of Ohio, to come and meet them as man to man, treated with respect and dignity. And as, the, as one of the bosses later said, he wrapped up the South before it even began. And half the votes needed to elect a Republican nominee were to be found in the South. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, a good chunk of your book, unsurprisingly, has to do with the general election against William Jennings Bryan. But so many chapters uh, in the first half of the book, or maybe a little bit more, deal with the race for, for the nomination. You make a really interesting assertion at one point in the book that McKinley ran the first modern presidential primary campaign. I think you're you're getting onto some of the ways in which he did things differently than um, than, than early Republicans had. Um, but talk a little bit more about what you mean by this first modern primary campaign. Well, generally, candidates sort of offered themselves uh, to, to, to run. They wanted, they made their intentions known, their interests known, and then they focused on getting a united delegation from their state and conciliating themselves with the, the, the bosses 
and he could care less about being in touch with the bosses. Oh. So he goes and sees them, pays his respects, but it is clear that he's going to go around them. And he recruits like-minded people who will go around the bosses. For example, there's a wonderful uh, figure who pops up in this in, in there who is lives in Connecticut. He is a wealthy, uh, you know, dilettante, if you will. Family is very wealthy. And while this is a machine state that's part of uh, the empire of, of, uh, of the easy boss, uh, Platt, uh, this, this young, young man gets McKinley to come and give a speech. Uh, McKinley gives a great speech. He you know, makes a lot of friends and, and, and get, ends up getting votes out of what ought to be a, a dead certain machine state, Connecticut. Uh, and this happens time and time again. He, 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 a, a colleague of his who served in the Congress from Wisconsin uh, during the 1870s and early 1880s goes uh, leaves the Congress, goes bankrupt, and removes himself to Arizona, uh, a territory that nonetheless has delegates at the National Convention. McKinley keeps in touch with him, and when the time comes, his his bank once bankrupt friend, who's uh, who's now a ne'er do well in Arizona but active in the Republican Party, helps bring delegates from Arizona to be in favor of him. There, it, all these friendships that he has allowed him to go around the machine and. Uh, and and pretty remarkable. And he also had an eye for talent. There's one figure who shows up who's the young son of of a of of a of a former one-term member of Congress from Ohio. The young man had gone to law school in Cincinnati and then headed west to make his his living. And he shows up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, where he uh, offices in a small office building with another young lawyer named William Jennings Bryan. And the two men, Charles Dawes and William Jennings Bryan, often have lunch at the diner with the head of the ROTC program at the University of Nebraska, sort of angry that he's not got a better assignment, a guy named John J. Pershing. And the three the three men often have lunch at the 25 cent diner in town. But I mean, McKinley picks him out. The kid shows up in 1894, says, you're the kind of reform-minded guy I want to run for president, and um, I'm for you. And when McKinley goes through Nebraska that fall during the congressional midterms, the kid shows up and says, here's a list of who I've got organized. Uh, for for uh, you and I'm working on the Dakotas and uh, and and uh, elsewhere in the Midwest and Mc and then the kid after the 1894 election moves to Chicago where he wants to become an entrepreneur buying um, gas utilities. Uh, Charles G. Dawes does and McKinley says you're the guy in charge of my campaign in Illinois. This is the critical battleground state for the primary season, which consists of conventions. And he picks the kid who is at that point 31 years old and only recently moved to Illinois. And why did he do it? Because he saw him as a young, bright, aggressive, well-organized, thoughtful man, young man who could who could captain his campaign, and he does. I have to say, until I read your book, I knew nothing about Charles Dawes' uh, career in the 1890s. To me, he's a figure from the 1920s, and you do a great job bringing him to life and showing how important he was to McKinley. But the better known figure is Mark Hanna, it seems to me. Talk about Mark Hanna and what role he played in the 96 campaign. Well, the best way to think of Mark Hanna is not as the great political genius. The way to think of Mark Hanna is the best friend. Mm -hmm. He's the Don Evans of George W. Bush. He is the, you know, he is the, you know, he's the close buddy. And he he falls in love with McKinley over the course of the 1880s. He's from Cleveland, a wealthy mm -hmm. industrialist. And he sees McKinley moving around politics in Ohio and becomes a fan and becomes devoted to him. And he plays an important role, particularly in the primaries, because, uh, you know, McKinley is the is the shot caller. Mm -hmm. But but Hannah is the doer. And the expediter, and but in the general election, we we always think of you know the campaign is run by Mark Hanna. Well, no, it isn't. It's 1896, and what I did is I sat down and charted through the newspapers where Hanna was every single day of the 118 days between the Republican convention and the general election, and he is on the road outside of Chicago uh, or Cleveland 70 out of the 118 days. Oh. Now this is before you know. You don't have cell phones. You don't even really have telephones because at that point, a telephone line rang, you know, one place at the other end of that line. And so, you know, he's on the road and maybe he's communicating by telegram and, and letter, but he's on the road raising money. The, the guy who's actually running the campaign, whose uh, uh, posterior is, you know, stapled to a seat in Chicago where the headquarters is, is 30, now 32-year-old Charles D. G. Dawes. And to read... 
the, the, the communications from him to his boss, William McKinley, and to Hannah is pretty remarkable because, first of all, he is on top of every penny in the campaign. He is on top of all of the this activity. He's got a you know gigantic staff uh, uh, and there in Chicago churning out literally materials by the train car load. They're dispatching you know literally train car loads of materials to the battleground states. And the campaign is being run by this kid. And and Hannah plays an important role because he's talking to the people who have to write checks. Uh, and but 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 he's he's not the skilled operative. He's got a temper. He's got a, he's got a little bit of an ego. Uh, but Dawes takes care of the campaign, and then uh, he's he has an unusual person who helps him uh, make peace with the New York machine with Thomas Collier Platt and the bosses, and that is young Theodore Roosevelt, mm -hmm. who, who who literally shows up when when Hannah shows up in New York, he he, uh, he shows up there with him and 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 counsels him. Uh, you know, you got to conciliate yourself to to Platt. Because if you don't have Platt in your corner, you're not carrying New York, and New York is the biggest swing state in the union. Yeah. You need it in order to win, and he gives him good advice and good counsel and helps conciliate the two men who don't like each other to begin with, let alone you know the fact that that Hannah has now beaten uh, Platt in the in the in the most important contest of Platt's life, namely the nomination of a Republican president. <laughs> Let, let me ask you a question that I'm sure you've heard once or twice before. Do you identify in any way with Mark Hanna, Dawes, any of these characters from 1896? Or did, did you, in the course of your own career, draw any particular lessons from them? Well, uh, I stole from them because I, I did. I started my research on this literally in before the, 19, before the 2000 election, 1890, uh, excuse me, 1995 and 1996. Uh, and so I, I was studying these men and what they did in order to win. But but no, I'm I'm Carl Rove. They were Mark Hanna and <laughs> Charles G. Dawes. You mentioned Dawes. People might be interested to know he's the second American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. At the age of 32, he becomes the controller of the currency in charge of the nation's banking system. He's the first director of the very first Bureau of the Budget, vice president of the United States under Calvin Coolidge. Uh, ambassador to Great Britain and the head, first head of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation under under Herbert Hoover as the Depression begins, and a very successful Chicago businessman, mostly in banking, and uh, extraordinary human being. Let's turn to the the other side in the general election, the Democrats and and William Jennings Bryan, who in in many ways, as as you uh, recount in your book, is, is an unlikely standard bearer for for the Democrats, given how little political experience he had. How did he manage to secure the nomination? He talked his way into it. Um, first of all, so let's step back for a minute. Yep. By 1896, 1895 and 1896, the Democratic Party is deeply divided over the issue of a gold currency versus silver. And Cleveland is seen as a gold, uh, he is a gold Democrat, the ultimate gold Democrat. And, and the country is in a deep depression and the, the populist element of the Democratic Party uh, says that it is all because he was a gold man and the, the, the nation has not yet been put on a bimetallic currency. And they begin an effort to basically, they don't think they can nominate a, a silver Democrat in 1896 because the Democratic rules are two thirds of the delegates have to nominate a candidate. But a half, but a majority can write the platform. So what they want to do is they want to have a silver platform and then force whoever the nominee is to support it. And they they are far more successful than they could ever imagine. And by the opening of the Democratic National Convention, they're within a handful of votes of dominating the convention. They, they have well over half. They are within a few votes of two thirds of the delegates of the convention. They proceed to steal enough delegates to become that. They throw out the Michigan delegation of gold men and replace it with silver men and, um, and thereby are able to nominate a silver Democrat. But Brian is not the front runner. The front runner is Richard Park Bland of Missouri, who for 30 years has led the fight for the free and unlimited coinage of silver, a cause of humanity itself, he says. And uh, he's, he's expected to be the leader and has the support of the major figures inside the um, the silver community, the silver movement inside the Democratic Party, but but Brian thinks that he can be the candidate, and he's about the only one. Uh, 
He has a close friend that he's met during his travels on behalf of the silver movement, Charles Rosser, head of the uh, state insane asylum in Texas. And the night before they begin the convention activities, Rosser and Brian's wife and Brian are having dinner and the two, the front runner, Bland of Missouri and the, and the, his close competitor, the governor of former governor of Iowa have their advocates play parading up and down the streets of Chicago. And, uh, and uh, Mrs. Brian turns to Rosser and says, does he, does, you know, William have a shot? And before Rosser can answer, uh, Brian answers, responds and says, they're, 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 that tomorrow they will be cheering my name and I will be the nominee because I am, uh, you know, the the logical choice. Uh, and uh, literally, Rosser thinks he's completely insane. Uh, but he becomes a nominee, and he does so by a series of accidents because he is. It starts when uh, he 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 could have been temporary chairman of the convention, in which case he would not have been the nominee. But Nebraska has provision. The Nebraska Goldmen have been provisionally seated, so he cannot become the temporary chairman of the convention unless uh, because his delegation hasn't been seated. Uh, he then uh, they then seat the Silverman, and but they pass him over for permanent chairman uh, of it. Um, they then have uh, people are asked to speak on the floor during a period of time, but he's in a credentials committee meeting, so he he misses the opportunity to speak. So. The, the the chairman of the of the uh, the leader of the gold of the silver men, Senator Jones of Arkansas, says to him, "Well, you haven't had a chance to speak. So I want you to be the floor manager for the platform fight." So he gives him a job, and uh, this will be his first chance because he hadn't had a chance to speak. He gets this assignment. Then the, the senator Pitchfork Ben Tillman of South Carolina says. I'm 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 one of the people designated to speak on half behalf of Silver. I want to speak first. So you, Brian, you have to close the argument, which was a mistake because you know Tillman has speaks first, but the guy who's going to be the last speaker is going to be the one that might be remembered as the guy who closes. Tillman, then they're 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 going through this. He's got 15 minutes. Well, well, one other thing. This all gets settled the day before he has to speak. So he's got time overnight to figure out what he wants to say. Then literally while they're in the debate. One of the gold men, Russell, the governor of Massachusetts, says that I'm not going to have enough time. People are chewing up my time. Let's extend the debate by 15 minutes, which means rather than having 15 minutes to close, Brian has 30 minutes to close. Oh. And he gets up on the floor of the convention and gives the famed cross of gold speech, oh. which incidentally was also was an accident because he'd had a paid speaking engagement in Crete, Nebraska on the Sunday before the convention begins. And in there, he resurrected a line he used one time in a congressional debate, you shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. And it had such a good response. He said to himself, if I get a chance to speak at the convention, I'm going to use it. But he gets up and gives a speech. People are not paying much attention. He starts to speak, but he's got an incredible voice and it's an incredible speech. No matter whether you're a gold man or a silver man, it is well worth reading because it is unbelievable. I mean, he and he begins to grab the people's attention when he sort of begins to describe why the, the ordinary people of America are worthy of the respect of the financial institutions and their government. You know, the man who is employed for wages is as much a businessman as his employer. The attorney in a country town is as much a businessman as a corporation council in a great metropolis. The merchant of the crossroads store is as much a businessman as the merchant of New York. The farmer who goes forth in the morning and toils all day is as much a businessman as the man who goes upon the board of trade and bets on the price of grain. And then he gives this unbelievable line of uh, the miner who goes a thousand feet into the earth are as much businessmen as the few financial magnets who in a back room corner the money of the world. And one of his one of his friends is sitting next to a farmer who stands up and says, oh, my God, my God, my God, and literally punches his hat out. So by the time he finishes with the famous line at the end, I mean, he think about this, not to waste too much time. But one more paragraph. He said, there are two ideas of government. Republicans believe if you just legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, then their prosperity will leak through on those below. Democrats believe if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up and through every class that rests upon it. Have, have you heard that before? Anyway, at the end, when he delivers the line, you shall not crucify uh, mankind on a cross of gold, he, he thrusts out his hands, he puts his, his head forward, he says the line, he finishes the speech, 
It's incredible. It's absolutely still. He drops his hands to his side and begins to walk off thinking, I've, 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 I've missed it. Nobody's going to respond. And the place goes utterly, completely mad. <laughs> and uh, 24 hours later, he is the nominee of the Democratic Party. Carl, what, one of the reasons why it seems to me these elections from the late 19th century can be somewhat obscure, or feel very distant, is that the two big issues, the tariff and the gold standard, strike us as pretty arcane and very distant. You've done a little bit of this already, but maybe just briefly, um, remind us why these were such passionate issues in, in this moment of American history. Well, the Republican Party believed that that we had to protect the industries of America from unfair foreign competition, and the way to do that was to have high tariffs. And Democrats believed that the tariffs were, accurately enough, paid for by working people. So when you charged uh, high tariffs on coffee and uh, and sugar, the, the person who was paying that was the little man and the little woman. And so the two parties had had a you know 60-year disagreement over this issue. But the other issue that intruded was this issue that's hard for us to get around, and that is a gold versus a silver currency. And what we have is a period during which there's economic strains, and you know we don't have a, 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 the national banking system we have today. Money, and when money gets tight, the economy contracts, and there is a, a belief that grows throughout the, the Gilded Age among Democrats, but also Republicans, that the way to respond to the, the challenge, our economic challenges, was to provide more money. And the way to do that is to either print greenbacks, paper money, or to, uh, to, to uh, make silver equal with, with gold, to have a bimetallic currency. At this point, the only major country with a bimetallic currency is, is, is Germany, which is actually starting to move away from a, a bimetallic currency. Everybody else is on the gold standard. And so the question was, which is the best way to assure prosperity in America, an inflationary silver currency or uh, a gold money currency? Thank you. Very, very well done. <laughs> really complicated issues. Um, so when we get to the general campaign. There's William Jennings Bryan out there, and you, you chronicle this in such detail, just town after town after town, speech after speech after speech, really making making the case in this with this oratory for which he is he is well known. But McKinley makes a different choice and he engages in what we call the front porch campaign, which, you know, there are many ways in which this election feels kind of modern and, and is path breaking, but this feels a little bit old fashioned. Talk about the the yeah. front porch campaign, what it was and why McKinley chose to campaign in that way. Well let me start by saying a quick word about Brian. He spends most of this uh, August, September, and October on the road, mm -hmm. which is unusual. Most presidential candidates, in fact, every presidential candidate before that point stayed at home. They didn't campaign across the country. And here's a guy, particularly through the beginning of October, he's traveling by himself, hoping that somebody meets him at the train. Mm -hmm. uh, he's wired ahead that he's coming and that people will be there. And he's speaking to unbelievable crowds. Mm -hmm. But but what happens is McKinley is inclined. McKinley, McKinley's advisors say you got to go out and match the guy, and he says, you know, I can't. You know, he's like a trapeze artist. I'm not. I'm. I, I can't. I got to think before I speak. And so, no, I'm not going to do that. But what happens is people start coming to Canton, Ohio, which is on main rail lines, north and south, east and west. And so people start coming, and so they decide to turn this, uh, you know, in essence, problem into. An advantage. And so they start encouraging people to come to Canton, Ohio. 750,000 people, an estimated 750,000 people, three quarters of a million people make their way to this little town in eastern Ohio in order to, you know, uh, go, go up North Market Street and stand in front of McKinley's house and have him come out on the porch and speak to him. And it's a marvelous story because it's, you know, it obviously required a great deal of organization, but it's also emblematic of the passion that people had at the time. And so there are all kinds of groups that come there. They're you know, from all across the country. And one of the most important moments in the campaign happens on October 9th of 1896. Uh, trains begin arriving uh, in uh, Canton uh, in uh, le the late morning. And off walk men generally dressed in butternut gray. These are Confederate war veterans. The country has never seen this. The Republicans and Democrats have been continuing to fight the Civil War, and yet here is a Republican war veteran who's invited 2,000 Confederate veterans of the Shenandoah Valley campaigns. These were the men who were trying to kill him. He's invited them to come to Canton, and they're met at the train station by uh, the Grand Army of the Republic. 
the the women's auxiliary has uh, created a banner for them uh, that that fe it features a famous quote from uh, George Washington that's a favorite of of uh, McKinley's. There should be no north, no south, nor east, no west, but a common country. Each man is given a um, a, a knife, a pocket a pocket knife with bearing that slogan, and they're given gray and blue badges that have the same on it. Uh, they're delayed a while because a couple of trains have been stopped by a washout. So it's they're serenaded by the union bands. They're fed um, food by this uh, by the by the women of Canton, uh, and then in, in the early afternoon, the rest of the trains have arrived, and men in blue and men in gray form up as units with their bands and begin to walk, march out of the uh, county uh, the county courthouse square up North Market Street. And the newspaper reports are unbelievable because people are literally lining the, the road and weeping at the sight of men in blue and men in gray in a sign of national reconciliation, playing patriotic songs and marching together. And they show up in front of uh, his house and he comes out and says, if we are forced to fight again, and God forbid that we shall, we shall fight as brothers under a common flag. And this is something the country has never seen. The whole idea of re reconciliation between North and South is just simply extraordinary. The nation has continued to be divided for 30 some odd years after the Civil War. And here's a man who, who courageously fought for the freedom of all Americans as a member of the Union Army, welcoming his Southern brethren back into the fold. And as, it, as luck would have it, I have two of the badges. <laughs> and little did he know that in 1898 with the Spanish-American War, he would have a chance as president to preside over precisely that sort of conflict. Right. Um, it, you know, th that number is 750,000 is so remarkable. And I think you say in the book that that was one out of 20 eligible voters, voters in the United in States. Yeah. In, oh. An incredible number. Yeah, and, and look, I've got a gigantic collection of these buttons because it's also a first modern political campaign. And there, you got everybody for for almost a century, there have been items that people would wear to, to show their support for presidential candidate. Yeah. But the volume of them and the variety of them, I mean, every 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 uh, industry in America, you know, you had railroad workers and chemical workers and, you know, uh, tool and die makers and so forth. All of them have their own badges. Yeah. And so these groups that would come to, uh, to uh, Canton would 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 all be decked out in you know in and they'd bring things to give McKinley but they were all decked out with badges and jackets and you know uh, ribbons and they're showing their their background and and McKinley makes this into an advantage. There's a giant parade in Chicago uh, in September uh, of of the gold money uh, supporters. And the turnout is so big that that and this was Hannah's idea. Hannah says, "Why don't we have on on the final uh, day of of November? Why don't we? Or excuse me, of October. Why don't we have a uh, flag day? Let's have a gigantic series of parades all across the country, um, where we will stand with our flag and, and proclaim America's greatness." And, and Brian makes a critical mistake. He's in Ohio campaign, which is battleground state. And he basically says, well, we ought to do that because that way everybody ought to put a flag out so that the employers don't know what uh, who's voting Democrat and fire them. When he should have said we should all join in. This is a great. I, we have a great country. And instead, he looks like spalming and, and, and petty, which he was at that point. But there's a giant there are giant parades everywhere in America and the most lavish is in New York City, where the parade begins at 10 o'clock in the morning and ends at after six o'clock in the evening as tens of thousands of men and women parade through the streets of New York. So, Carl, then fast forwarding to the actual election, November of 1896, uh, McKinley, obviously, uh, uh, wins. And, and you devote a good chunk of the last chapter of your book to unpacking some of the reasons why, uh, in the end, McKinley came out on top. And uh, uh, all of those those points that you make are fascinating. I wanted to ask you, though, about a, a, a couple of them in, in particular. You, you, you suggest that McKinley succeeded in winning over workers, the laboring class, which maybe isn't something that we would intuitively think of when we think of you know the party of business in the late 19th century being the Republicans. Talk about how he managed to pull that off and to what extent that was a, a kind of watershed in American politics. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, he's screwing it up. He wins the nomination. He thinks the gold versus silver issue is going to go away. He wants to make it all about the protective tariff, which he has fostered and fought for for decades. 
But smart people around him, including, you know, buddies from Ohio say, this issue is not going away. And, and one of the people who sort of says to him plainly is the former president, uh, Benjamin Harrison, who says the people get to decide what the issue is, and they've made their decision. It's the currency. So he starts talking in August about the currency, but it is the language of business. Uh-huh. It's the language of we have to have gold currency because... It's important to the uh, to capital formation and to the creation of to the strengthening of our economy and blah 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 blah, yeah. and two people pop up in in late August and early September who have better language. One is the former president of the Knights of Labor, the largest labor union in America, who's the mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania, and he he is one. And the other one is the the. Uh, uh, the man who was defeated for the mayorship of New York, he ran third and 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 was rewarded with being made a police commissioner, but a year later hates the job and is desperate to find a way to get to Washington. And that's the ambitious young weasel, Theodore Roosevelt. And Ro- Roosevelt begins to give speeches where he talks about the same issue, but he says, here's a half a loaf of bread. That's what a silver dollar will buy you. Here's a full loaf of bread, which a gold dollar will buy you. And the worker man deserves to have a fair day's wage for a full day's work. And that's got to be a gold dollar. That's the only way he's going to be able to provide it for his family. And these two men, the mayor of Scranton and the police commissioner of New York, sort of basically give McKinley, uh, you know, new material and new language and a new approach that begins to influence what he says in Canton to the crowds that are coming. And more importantly, uh, to the Republican speakers in the uh, who are cr- crisscrossing the country, advocating on his behalf, and to these train car loads of material that are pouring out of the Chicago headquarters, and you go and read them, and they are all focused. Whether it's the speeches or the material, they're aimed at this message of here's why gold is important to the working man and working woman. Silver is going to be, you know, a silver dollar is worth only fifty cents of gold, and so what's going to happen if we have bimetallic currency? People are going to pay you in silver and 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 buy in gold, and you're not going to have a gold to buy, so you're not going to be able to provide for your family, and uh, you you you're you're the working man who's made this country great, whether it's in the coal mines or the steel mills or uh, the farms, and uh, you deserve to be paid what you're worth, and that's a gold dollar, yeah. and it, it it becomes a powerful message. It's also helped by the fact that in October. There is a resurgence of farm prices, which have been depressed for the last several years. So Republican farmers now say, you know what? I don't have a mortgage, so I don't have to pay, you know, pay. Uh, and now I'm suddenly making good prices for my crops and my produce. And so I'm 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 now feeling better because uh, the gold currency is what's keeping our uh, keeping our economy strong. And uh, you know, the, the guy who's for me is McKinley. Another important factor you identify is McKinley's ability to run as an an outsider in a, in a way that feels very, very twentieth century. Um, but you 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 point out we were talking about this earlier that he was able to position himself against the bosses, against the the party establishment. Um, I would, did did he break the power of of the uh, the bosses? Is that one of the ways in which eighteen ninety six is an important watershed moment? Where where well, where, where do party politics go after that? Yeah. Yeah, he doesn't break them. He mm-hmm. diminishes them yeah. um, because they still last. I mean, as long as there's patronage jobs, uh, governors and mayors will control, you know, for the for the first decade, second decade of the 20th century, this they, they still these bosses still are around. But yes, he 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 by going to the convention unbidden, uh, you know, unbeholden to them, uh, he he diminishes their power. And he he, you know, we then begin to have by you know, by 14 years later, we have the the growth of primaries. And by 1912, we have a pretty large number of primaries compared to what we, and there are no primaries in 19, in, in 1896, but by 1912, there are six or seven or eight states that are now choosing their candidates uh, for office by primaries, including their presidential candidates uh, by, by primaries that select delegates. So, but yes, he, he's an outsider. He's also an outsider in the sense that he is not, he's interested in in not rewarding the machine, the members of the machine, he's in rewarding excellence. He wants to find bright young men. Of course, this is an era in which public service is almost exclusively limited to men. But he wants to fight bright, bright young men who share his reform impulses and whom he thinks will be able to deal with the challenges of this rapidly changing, industrialized, 
uh, or increasingly urbanized economy that he sees growing in America. You write at the very end of your book that the McKinley campaign matters more than a century later uh, today because it, and I'm quoting here, provides lessons either party could use today. What are those lessons? Well, one, <clears throat> McKinley was focused on addition. He was looking for um, people who he could draw to him by his message and his persona. And too often today, we seem to think that all we got to do is, uh, you know, generate our base. He was aimed at persuasion, about expanding the base, if you will, and by persuading people to come along. Second of all, he he believed in a politics that uh, was uplifting and positive. And, you know, he was capable of saying, you know, what was bad about Brian. He was capable of saying uh, what was bad about the Democrats when he was in Congress, but he was principally and primarily focused on articulating a positive and optimic, uh, optimistic vision of what he felt the future ought to be like. Third of all, he's an admirable personality. I mean, he drew people to into politics uh, who, uh, you know, who, who, were, who were drawn by what kind of a person he was. You know, his wife was an invalid. He lost uh, he lost his daughters. He was a combat veteran of the Civil War. He was a, you know, he was personable. Um, you know, he, he didn't have sharp edges. He was enormously uh, uh, honest and trustworthy. And these were, you know, qualities that people found appealing. Um, and then he ran a well-organized effort. This was not, you know, sort of, I'm going to stand there and wait for things to happen. Uh, he surrounded himself, whether it's Mark Hanna or Charles Dawes or or others in his orbit, he surrounded himself with people who would come up with a plan to achieve something and go out and achieve it. And you saw this when he became president. He has the first modern chief of staff, uh, this young, young guy from Connecticut, uh, Addison Porter, uh, who doesn't last very long, incidentally. It turns out he's a terrible alcoholic. And uh, he lasts about six months as chief of staff and then is quietly moved out of the White House and dies two years, two or three years later of alcoholism. Uh, Harlan Crow happened to see his White House uh, chief of staff chair from the from the staff table and bought it at auction and gave it to me. I have it in my office, Addison Porter's chair. He must have been a small man. But uh, but, you know, he's just he's. He ran, he ran a modern campaign at a time when that gave him a significant edge, and he made it about big issues, and he made it about what he wanted to do for the country, and less about, you know, why his opponent was so bad and what a terrible person there was. It, let me ask, it, by the way, let me pause just for a moment to invite members of our audience to put questions into the, the, the Q&A, and I'll turn things over to Sandy Cress in just one moment. In fact, I'll ask you just... Um, one more question. Um, and it has to do with Teddy Roosevelt, the figure about whom Americans know much more than I think they know about uh, William McKinley. In, to what extent was Teddy Roosevelt's political career, his political style, his outlook shaped by his association with the much less known William McKinley? Well, uh, remember when McKinley is shot in September of 1901, uh, you know, several months after being sworn in for a second term with Roosevelt as his running mate. Uh, and he is he is shot and killed, uh, though he lingers for a number of days. Um, when he is buried in Canton, Ohio, the first promise that Theodore Roosevelt makes as a new president is that he will continue the cabinet and continue the policies of William McKinley. He was enormously popular at the time of his death. 500,000 people lined the railroad lines between Buffalo, where he was shot, and Washington, D.C., uh, the, the stories, uh, and I put them, uh, I, I didn't put them in the book, but I'm going to, I'm writing an article about them. I mean, the scenes are amazing. The, the, the train comes rolling into Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and a crowd of 30,000 people jam packs the train station. The governor of Pennsylvania cannot fight his way through the crowd to pay his respects to Mrs. McKinley. He, uh, the, the, the train comes into Baltimore, uh, and um, people have strewn the, the uh, tracks with flowers so that when the, by the time that the, the uh, the, the locomotive comes into the station, it's covered in flowers. Uh, when it comes on well, the last run into Washington, D.C., where he's going to lie in state in the Capitol, the reporters say that uh, lining the, tra the train tracks to Washington are, uh, and, and the growing dusk are 
uh, people have lit fires and most of them are black farmers standing there silently as hats off as their leader comes by. But when he's buried, Roosevelt is standing apart from the rest of the cabinet because he's afraid his emotions will overcome him. So without being Roosevelt's, uh, without being involved in the campaign of 1896, we probably would never have heard of Roosevelt again, or at least certainly not in that same way as the assistant secretary of the Navy with the Navy secretary on um, vacation. He sends the famous telegram to Dewey to load coal and make steam. And if, the, if uh, hostilities are declared and the Spanish attempt to break out of the harbor of Manila, destroy them, he couldn't resign in a blaze of glory and organize the Rough Riders and uh, go to Cuba. He couldn't charge up San Juan Hill. He couldn't charge up Kettle Hill. He could not be mustered out in September of 1898 in September and five weeks later be elected governor of the state of New York. Uh, and it all depended upon him in the 1896 campaign. And he's not a big fan of Roosevelt. He brought backs Reed for the nomination, writes influential articles in, 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 in big publications and, and does encourages his friends to be supportive. And, and after, after McKinley is nominated, he writes his sister Bammy a letter and says, you know, uh, we had a great gold platform in, in, in St. Louis, uh, and McKinley is a good man, but he is weak, and I worry about him in a moment of crisis for our country. And then a couple of days later, writes one of McKinley's closest personal friends and says, uh, we must do everything we can to elect McKinley, and when he's elected, you must be the minister to France, or the, at least the secretary of the treasury, and my ambitions, such as they are, can go by the wayside, which is his way of saying, help, I need your help, but Bellamy Stoyer, friend of McKinley, help me get in, and he later invites uh, invites the Stoyers, close friends of McKinley from Cincinnati, Ohio, to Oyster Bay, takes Mrs. Stoyer, who's got the mental and political uh, brains of the family, out and uh, rows her around Long Island Sound and says, I need your help. I need to, and I need you to get me close to McKinley because the only way I can resurrect my political career is to, to get a job in Washington after the election. Will you help me out? She later writes uh, that Roosevelt spoke, excuse me, Roosevelt rode like he spoke spasmodically. And, 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 he, and, he, and he's, he's, he's just... You know, there's this great moment. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, his great friend, who was the campaign manager for Reed, says, I've been asked to, as the senator from Massachusetts to campaign in western New York, which is the battleground region of the state. And will you come, come with me? Don't say no. Don't say police. Come with me. Well, he has no idea that Roosevelt is desperate for such an opportunity. And so the two men can do a barnstorm through western New York. And who gets the headlines? Theodore Roosevelt, because he says so many ugly things about about uh, about uh, Brian that, that he gets the headlines, not the senator. And their mutual friend, John Hay, writes another friend and says, um, um, uh, Cabot and, and T.R. are going to, and Teddy, are off to count to bear their tummies to the major, McKinley's nickname, and commit <laughs> Harry Carey. And out of this, uh, somehow or another, uh, McKinley gets in, Mc, the McKinley campaign invites uh, Roosevelt to trail Brian through the Midwest uh, and 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 appear the, the day before, the day after that Brian is in a town. And he gives a famous speech called The Age of the Demagogue in Chicago and uh, just lacerating Brian on a Monday. I found a previously unknown speech that he delivered on Wednesday in which he's polishing the Monday speech. And by Saturday, he's he's polished it pretty sharp. And it's given as a speech called the Jack Cade speech in Detroit, lacerating Brian while Brian is in is in Chicago and, and Detroit. And Roosevelt thought so much of these speeches that when he later put together his own collection of speeches, the only two speeches from 1896 are these two speeches. And, and at the end of the campaign, uh, uh, the Stoyers go back to Roosevelt and I uh, actually mean go back to McKinley press for for R Roosevelt. And that's where he says, I do not trust your young man, Roosevelt. He's too pugnacious, but he nonetheless makes him the assistant secretary of the Navy, without which his future is not possible. Oh, Carl Rove, you clearly have plenty of great material for a sequel to the triumph of William McKinley. I can't wait to uh, learn more about uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Um Thank you so much for spending time with me this afternoon. It's such an honor to have you as part of this 
series. Um, thank you for taking time away from your day job and producing this this wonderful book. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Sandy Kress uh, for uh, the last part of our program. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Carl, I just have to say this, not as your friend, uh, but as a pretty tough critic, uh, this book was just fantastic. Oh, well, thank you, Sandy. Really, it's a, it's a great read. Uh, it's a fine history. And what I really admire most about it is that you've lifted up a person of virtue uh, and challenged us all to examine this, this person, and I think to emulate him. And, and uh, I admire you especially for that. And I want to ask you some questions uh, about that in a moment. But I, I want to uh, sort of allocate uh, the time I have to three areas, uh, questions that are posed by people from the audience. One is about the man, McKinley. Two, about uh, the election. And then three, the legacy itself. Uh, you've done such a fabulous job of of convincing me and others about McKinley. Uh, and I just uh, want to ask you, why has the nation been so slow to see it? You know, there are these presidential rankings. I think he's come up a little bit among historians, the C-SPAN, but but he's still sort of above average, middle of the pack. Uh, what is it that the nation, why is it that the nation has, uh, has missed uh, seeing him as high as I think you portray him and as he ought to be portrayed? Yeah. Well, I think uh, I've got a crackpot theory about it, and that is that what followed in the 1910s and 20s were the, was the age of progressive historians. And two, two things marshaled against poor McKinley. One was the gigantic personality of Theodore Roosevelt, who was, in, it was either an inspiration or, in many instances, a friend to the progressive historians. And second of all, the progressive historians... The, the beginning of the of Roosevelt's agenda is to be found in McKinley and and but they didn't want to give him credit. And, you know, and he was also look, he was not the he was he was not the you know, he he got things done without taking a two by four to his opponents. Yeah. So I think the progressive historians did a lot to, to sort of damage it. But think about it. First man to first one to have a trade rep. He was literally moving the country into uh, a period of reciprocity. You know, he, he restored the nation's economy almost overnight by and we by by holding to the gold standard. He he prosecuted. He acquired a Hawaii, which desperately didn't want to fall into the hands of the Japanese, which they were afraid they were going to. He he, he won the Spanish-American War and then make, made immediate steps to both free to give Cuba independence and to bring the Philippines into independence. And and he ran a, a you know a, a progressive administration that that uh, had you know important advances, but you know the historians get to write the books and the and the historians at the time didn't. We've since had there's a great biography of his particularly of his presidential year by Robert Mary, uh, and then uh, there that Lewis Gould has written a terrific book about about the elect about about him and, and his presidency. Uh, another uh, uh, man who's in my uh, dedication was a uh, uh, professor at SMU, uh, R. Hal Williams. He's written a terrific book about the election of 1896 uh, that's shorter than mine, doesn't have as much color. But, but uh, you know, there have been a bunch of historians who began to try and re-resurrect uh, his, his reputation, but it, it, it took a big bang in the 1910s and 20s. You know, you just may, mentioned a couple of things. I just want to ask you if you want to say anything more about the two or three things that uh, uh, are the best examples of his achievements, of his accomplishments, of things that uh, that are that made a difference then or are lasting. Uh, you mentioned a couple of those things a moment ago, but take a little bit more time with us on what he did that made a no. difference. Well, the first thing was he restored confidence in our economy. So we went from the depths of the greatest economic depression that we had until the Great Depression itself and helped restore through uh, fiscal soundness and a commitment to the gold standard prosperity. So much so that when he ran for re-election in 1900, the slogan was the fool dinner pail. And that was the symbol of the campaign was that, you know, now the working man uh, could, uh, you know, had had lunch that he could take with him and could provide for his family. Second of all, he modernized the government and modernized particularly the office of the president. He has the first chief of staff. He has the first press secretary. 
He actually organizes the, the White House so that it could function. Um, and then, as you know, he presided over. Uh, he was reluctant. He was not a he was not a jingoist by any stretch of the imagination. But he he felt the country was pushed into the war with Spain over Cuba, and and he uh, he both won the war and then did what Americans typically do, which is he he gave up the rewards. He was not in. He, was, he said, "We're not going to keep Cuba." We you know I've I'm as a Republican. He said, "I've I've been committed for decades to the freedom of the Cuban people." He said, "We're not going to keep the Philippines as a as as part of an empire. We're going to set them on the path to to the creation of their own independent government." Uh, and we will not treat Hawaii as a, an, a, you know, as as a part of an empire. It will be made a, a territory and put on the path towards statehood, uh, eventual statehood. And so, it, in that way, is a modern president. Uh, H. Harrison in our crowd today asked, "How is the news of the front porch campaign portrayed across the country? Uh, and then, what role did the newspaper endorsements play in the election?" Two two part question. Yeah, uh, the 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 uh, the the front porch campaign was carefully monitored by the national press uh, because McKinley had remarks that were uh, you know that were tipped towards what the interests of that part of the country might be. So the idea that he was sending a message to, for example, border states. He was the first Republican president to you know to carry the border states. Brian only carried one border state, Missouri. The rest of them went for you know, uh, went for uh, for McKinley. And so the national press looked for what was his message, if you will, of the day. The second thing is, is that they brought the press with them. So if if the, you know, if the Providence, Rhode Island, uh, Greek fishermen, uh, uh, sponge men came from, uh, you know, came, they brought a press man with them. And of course, that got great press back home. And then they thought about things like these patriotic parades, the gold, uh, the, the Goldman parade in Chicago, um, which was duplicated elsewhere, the sound money parades. And then they, then the, 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 uh, October 31st, I think it is, is the, uh, is the, uh, uh, flag day, uh, parades. So they involve people all around the country, which again, generated press. And, and Brian is also getting great press because he's, he's good copy and he's traveling around the country and he is giving long speeches with plenty of things to say in them. Uh, uh, McKinley's are relatively brief um, to each of these groups that are visiting him, but, but Brian is out there on the campaign trail and it just, both men's activities fed on the other. Did newspaper endorsements matter in the, in the campaign? Yeah, they did because that you know, look, this is an era where there is very li limited pliability in the election electorate. That is to say, you're a Republican or a Democrat, and it, but it's a very high turnout, highest turnout that we've it, that we've had. We've had no turnout since then has been as high, mm -hmm. and 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 newspaper endorsements are critical in getting what little pliability there is in the electorate. And there are the the re, there's Republican defections in the West led by Republican Senator, one of the founders of the Republican Party, Senator Teller of Colorado, leaves the Republican Party and leads the silver Republicans into the Democrats. But then a group of gold Democrats uh, leave the Democratic Party. Some of them uh, support a third party ticket consisting of two ancient gold Democrats. But some of them also come across for the for the Republicans. My, one of my favorites is is a there is a, a Democratic congressman from from uh, New York, uh, an Irishman. Uh, he's a wonderful uh, figure of the times. Uh, let's see if I've got a, I think I've got a picture of him here. Um, Burke Cochran. Um, and he was a very attractive guy. And uh, Burke uh, was a bachelor and he broke his leg in 1895 and, uh, excuse me, 1896, in the spring of 1896, and goes abroad to recuperate in the arms of his lover, a British widow who lives in Paris. And, uh, he becomes quite close to her son, who actually stays with Burke in 1895 when he comes to uh, when he comes to uh, uh, New York on his way to Cuba to, to cover the Spanish uh, the battle with guerrillas in Cuba. And anyway, something happens in the relationship with his lover, and he returns to the United States in the fall and uh, uh, sends word that he should be met at the uh, at the docks, and he is. And he tells the reporters, "I'm a I'm a I'm a Tammany Hall Democrat, and I always will." Be, but I'm also a gold man, and I will always be a gold man, and therefore I'm going to support William McKinley, and I urge all gold-minded Democrats to join with me. And this is a shock because this just it never happens. It's sort of like John Conley endorsing, you know, Richard Nixon in 1972, and um, 
He then gives a famous speech at uh, Madison Square Gardens on behalf of uh, urging gold Democrats to support McKinley. And the, his, the son of his lover uh, writes him a letter from London saying, I read your speech. I hope it has the impact that you uh, that you have, uh, that you hope it has, because it's a marvelous speech. Uh, sincerely yours, Winston Spencer Churchill. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, Carl, I want to, uh, I love your theory about the difference, the legacy that McKinley makes over this, the, the, the way he changed politics for 30 years ahead. But I want to challenge that a little bit just to get you to uh, respond to me uh, by throwing out to you a sui generis kind of explanation. That is, that it can be explained just as uh, one of a kind things, as opposed to a, a big different, a big that's different thing. Uh, if you were to look at the, these races, so they went in 1896, 1900s of victory, huge economic success. That sort of explains itself. 1904, McKinley is venerated. Roosevelt is popular. Uh, an incumbent, no eight, popular, uh, picks Taft. They win. Both of us have to deal with the fact that 1912 and 1916 are a mess. Uh, they're their own thing. And then you could say that the 20, 24, 28 races, these are Republican. This is the 20s are a Republican decade. I mean, this is economically successful, roaring 20s. I mean, is it possible that all of that success could be explained by all of those many explanations, as well as some grand theory about the difference McKinley made? Well, um, yeah, I think you've made my case. We have 32 years of Republican dominance, that, and, and, and it's only broken at the presidential level and at the House where we divide among ourselves in 1912. But if you look below that, we have a record number of states that have Republican governors, record number of Republican legislators, record number of Republican members of the Congress and both the House and Senate for most of this decade and or most of these decades. And when we don't, it's because we 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 uh, divide among ourselves. And if you look at the voting patterns, particularly in the major industrial states, the blue collar working class neighborhoods and counties are overwhelmingly Republican. And again, it, it, you know, it only, Wilson gets elected in 1912 only because Roosevelt uh, decides that he wants to return to the White House and, and it's a three-way race, but uh, Wilson gets about the same percentage of the vote in 1912 that William Jennings Bryan did in his third race for the presidency in 1908. And yet, uh, because the Republicans are split, uh, Wilson gets 435 electoral college votes. Yeah, yeah. I've got a big question for you in the end, and I see the clock ticking away, but I can't help but ask you, golly, there's so many little mini things I'd love to ask you. I was, I was surprised to see that New York City uh, that McKinley lost New York City in, in 1900 by 30,000 votes after having won it by 60,000 in 1896. I would have thought by appealing to immigrants and all of that, that he would have continued to carry New York City. Is there another reason he lost it? Well, I think there are two reasons. One is the, the amount of, we, we think we got a lot of immigrants coming into the country today. Go yeah. back then. And the, you see a gigantic a growth in the electorate in in uh, New York in New York City in in uh, in the in the in, in those in that four simple years. The the second thing is is that in local politics had uh, sort of intruded, and so you know so the, the 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 Tammany Hall Democrats who did not like uh, Brian that much by by uh, 1900 had sort of said, you know what, uh, we got to get back in the game. And so the issue of gold and silver that had divided the Democrats was beginning to recede. And the question was more incredible, was more increasingly, are we imperialist or not? And what, what are we going to do about the trusts? So to some degree, the, the issue uh, had changed. But the main thing was the, you know, the electorate. You go to, you go to some of these uh, wards in New York and assembly districts, and it's shocking how much growth there is during the period of the 90s, and particularly in the latter, in the latter half. Yeah, so the, the, that he appealed to them was one thing, but it overran his right. politics. Okay, I got to spend the last few minutes on this, Carl. Uh, you, you, you have recruited candidates, you've run campaigns, you've been as active in politics as anyone I know, and, you're, and you've now written this book about 
a noble character, a person of virtue. Uh, how can a person of great virtue run and win today? Is it possible for such a person to run and win today? Uh, I mean, I like to think you wrote this book because I think you kind of hope that we will have a McKinley again. Uh, what would you say, uh, what, what can we do as a, as a citizenry uh, to find more people like this and to encourage them and to, and to help support them and, and make them win? Can they win? What would you say? Yeah, oh, absolutely. They can win. I mean, look at now we've got, you know, we've got two candidates, the front runners for their respective party nominations. And, uh, you know, more than, you know, six out of every 10 Americans don't want them to run. Yeah. One, both of them to, not to run. And, and, yet you, they're, and yet there are candidates. So, yeah, well, that's, you know, the, the politics is broken in today, but it's been broken before. It was broken for the quarter of a century before William McKinley entered uh, the, the, the list. Uh, and it's been broken before in our lifetimes. We think politics is bad today. Go back to the uh, the late 1960s and the early 1970s when and, and the 70s when it looked like the country was falling apart. So, uh, look, we're in a place where the American people don't want. I mean, seven out of every 10 Americans, better than seven out of every 10 Americans, say one guy's too old. And nearly as many people say the other guy should be made president. So, it is what it is, and we're going to have to pick between them. But we should not. That one of the lessons of 1896 is is that good people do offer themselves up, and when they do, they tend to win. I mean, think about the think about 1932. We had an admirable president in uh, in in Herbert Hoover, but he was not up to it, and the country said we we want to take the you know, relatively young governor in New York who can't even stand on his own two feet, but because he says we we have nothing to fear but fear itself, we're, we got to give it a go. Take 1980. We got the nice, you know, the admirable, you know, uh, Navy veteran who's a, a good Christian and was the governor of the progressive governor of the South and seemed to be open minded on race and but he'd restored dignity and honor to the White House. And then he seemed to be you know, sort of overrun by events, and the country was in malaise, and we we're sitting with double-digit interest rates, double-digit inflation, double-digit unemployment. We're sitting in gas lines. Along comes this B actor from California, and in one debate, there's only one debate in 1980. He seems to strike a note that 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 touches us. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? And we say, well, you know what? He we're a little bit concerned about is he too right wingy, but. You know, he's at least been the governor of the most populous state in the union, and we take a bet on him. That's the way America works. When things appear to be bad, something, somebody good will come along. Well, I love it, Carl. Brilliant, factual, historic, and, and idealistic. You, you bring all of it to bear. We're, we're the beneficiaries of having you talk with us today. Grateful to have you. Grateful to spend time with you, as always. Well, thanks, Sandy, and thanks. To, it's always good to be with friends. Absolutely. I'm going to turn this back uh, to Phil Barnes to close this out. Well, thank you, Sandy, and thank you especially Carl Rowe and Mark Lawrence for a special afternoon. It was a, a, a wonderful conversation. Many of us in the audience are supporters of Humanities Texas and members of UT Alley or friends of the LBJ Library. If not, please check us out. Each of these organizations offers a wide variety of in-person and virtual programming. Information about them and how to contact these organizations is highlighted in our closing slides. I thank all of you for tuning in. We will be back next Thursday, September, February 15th at 4 for a conversation with journalist John Ward, the author of Camelot's End, Kennedy versus Carter, and the fight that broke the Democratic Party. I hope to see you next time. Thank you and good night.